how you know what and what you're looking to get out of your regenerative farming uh, journey. And also, we are going to have a Q and A session towards the end, so feel free to ask your questions along the way uh, between the team here. Uh, including our wonderful admin talent, Bella, who should be on the call somewhere. Um, we will get the questions aside and we can have a QA and a with Andre at the end. Um, so Helen and Hugo, just wanted to say hello and introduce yourself to the, to the audience that is growing by the second. It is indeed, and I'm thrilled seeing people joining in. So thank you very, very much for joining us. We're thrilled to have Andre here today. Uh, a little bit about ourselves. Um, Regen ag is the term these days, but 20 years ago, 30 years ago, it was natural farming, biological farming, farming without chemicals. And it's a, it's a new term and probably a very applicable term. And I'm going to ask Andre to just explain what he thinks Regen is, but we've been at it for a while, haven't we, Hugo? Yes, we've been at it uh, basically uh, well, from our parents' days in the 1950s onwards and learnt a lot of things from farmers along the way. And um, yeah, so it does, Helen said, the term has changed. But what is, what is beautiful now is that um, communities and farmers are sort of joining together more so than ever. And um, the supply chain is uh, being questioned dramatically. And with communities and farmers uh, realise that we've fouled our own nest so badly that um, that we've got to have change. So this word regenerative farming uh, has sort of come in and it's been accepted. So it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful time. It is too. And, and I think, you know, this whole renewal for people, and as Hugo said, people getting together, and only last night I read of a Canadian oat buying company that's not accepting uh, the crop that's been desiccated with glyphosate. So big changes are coming through. Um, and being forced onto the companies because of consumer demand. So everyone who's not even a farmer is starting to place demands on the type of farming that's been done by the quality of food that they want and preserving the environment and the ecology because we're, you know, things are becoming extinct. But anyway, that's enough about us. We've been around for a long time, starting with selling chemicals and realising the damage they were doing. So we've done the whole journey of selling seaweed and fertilisers and now filming people like Andre because we felt we people just weren't getting the right information. You are now, which is fantastic, but it's how do you go about it? So thanks, Ray. That's it, that's it for us. Uh, and we welcome Andre, who we did meet a long time ago in our filming career, Andre, with the voice conference yes. in Victoria with Liz Clay and uh, she was, yes. you, were, you were with iPhone then, the international, um, oh, I shouldn't have said iPhone, a... <laughs> iPhone yeah, yeah okay. I, I was the president of, of I, yeah, 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 I was yeah. the president of iPhone Organics International, the global umbrella body then, but Liz yeah. and I actually go back even further to the days of the Organic Federation of Australia where in those days I was actually the, the chair of 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 the board and listens on the board so yes um, and even further back to the early days of um organic certification and and, and in australia but after or well, actually even while i was still on the um, the president of iphone i was involved with others to set up regeneration international and we we started the whole international regeneration movement mm -hmm. because we wanted to move farming forward and particularly from the, the concept of sustainable farming, which had been, how can you say, it's been greenwashed and overused to the point where it was meaningless. And when Monsanto was advertising itself as the, the world's largest uh, sustainable agriculture uh, corporation at that point you knew that it was a totally meaningless term mm -hmm. yep so why we decided to use the, the term regeneration it actually uh, it was robert rodale who started it back in the 80s actually where he noticed that wherever 
um, anywhere in nature is disturbed, if you stop that disturbance, it, the ecosystem will regenerate. It's, it's a force in nature. And at the moment, what we're doing is degrading. We're degenerating all our ecosystems, including our farming ecosystems. So what we wanted to talk about is being more than just sustainable. Sustainable, by definition, is maintaining the status quo without further degrading it. But the status quo is unacceptable at the moment. And, and we don't need to go into the multiple reasons what is wrong with it we need to actually move from the status quo and start regenerating the systems and this is the actual power of regeneration the other reason why we wanted to use it is as an umbrella term for a lot of like-minded movements that are all you know fit under the umbrella so you know some of us we came out of the organic movement but there's agroecology, ecological agriculture, biological farming, permaculture, um, you know, holistic management. There's a lot of systems that we would call regenerative. And rather than us being in separate silos and saying who is better than who, what we need to say is that we actually all can bring really useful knowledge and information to the table and start working together to improve agriculture and, and move agriculture forward in a new direction. And I just want to say too that for us, when we, when we started this idea originally uh, in 2014, that it's actually surprised us how, how much the term regeneration has taken off around the whole world. You know, a few years ago, no one or very few people had heard of it. It is everywhere now. Right. And it's the, for us, it, it, it's, it's just a wonderful, positive farming revolution. And we've got so much interest. And it actually, I mean, it, 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 it's positive time for farming, which is what is so wonderful about it. So what I want to do today is just sort of set the scene and just explain how it starts. What is the basis of regenerate, regeneration, the powerful, you know, this powerful force in nature? And so I'd like to just start with a question I, I ask all the time. You know, what is the most important thing we do when we farm? And what it is is we actually use solar energy to power photosynthesis and to create what I call the molecules of life. The, the, the key molecule is glucose. What happens with photosynthesis in, is that in the, in the leaf of the plant, the chloroplasts combine carbon dioxide and water using solar energy and they make glucose and the byproduct is the oxygen we breathe. You know, the atmosphere we have now is a result of billions of years of photosynthesis. And when, when we look at a plant, something like 95 to 98 percent of a plant's biomass actually comes from water and carbon dioxide because those glucose molecules are put together to make cellulose, which is wood, the fiber of plants, but it's also used to make carbohydrates, other sugars. It's used to make hydrocarbons, which are fats, oils, add a bit of nitrogen or sulfur to it. We make amino acids, which is our proteins and hormones and so on. But glucose is the basic building block of life, the most the key molecule of life. And what, what I need to get together here is that by using solar energy and, and getting plants to synthesize and make the sugars, and actually in the leaves, they actually synthesize the carbohydrates and hydrocarbons and amino acids. And most of that is done in the leaf. The leaves are the key to growing plants. 
Everybody thinks plants feed from their roots. They get water and they get about between two and 5% of the nutrients from the soil, which are very important to get those right. But 95% to 98% of a plant actually comes from photosynthesis from water and carbon dioxide. And that is not taught when, when you're learning about how to grow plants. We ignore the 95%. And if we understand that, it changes the way we farm. And what we need, you know, one of the things that is being explained now, which is very important, is this concept of either called the liquid carbon pathway or, or the carbon gift. About 30% of all these carbon compounds that are created in the leaves are secre secreted by the roots into the soil and they feed the soil microbiome, the soil food web. And in science now, there's, there's a term called the rhizosphere. And the rhizosphere is the area of life, the microbes that live around the roots of plants. And this is the most biodiverse area on this planet. Because of all the exudates coming around, coming out of the roots, it feeds all these microbes. And these microbes will protect plants from diseases and pests. They release enzymes and acids that dissolve the nutrients in rocks and make them available. They build, you know, deep soil structure, deep, you know, deep roots deepen the soil and, and increase the soil microbiome. So when we're talking about soils and soil fertility, it's not buying you know, spending thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars on, on big bags of chemicals to, you know, to, and bringing in your fertility. We can build that fertility the way it's always been done in nature. In other words, we regenerate the soil by feeding it these molecules of life, these organic molecules that are secreted by the roots into the soil microbiome. and they now start making the nutrients available. They build soil, soil structure. Um, you know, one of the things that, you know, further in this course, we want, today's just an introductory course, we'll go into great detail on how that is done. But what I want to say is that plants correctly managed increase soil nutrients rather than depleting them we in the current paradigm it's oh you grow a crop you're exporting nutrients well if you're doing that you're not growing them properly what i want to explain is how using regenerative systems we can regenerate nutrients out of the soil because the truth is in the subsoil we have an endless supply of nutrients that actually goes to the center of the the earth it's technically endless and it's about management. And I want to show you this picture here because this says everything to explain what we're talking about. These are perennial grasses. And if you have a look at it, if you let it grow, you can see the roots and how deep they go. And those roots, as they go, grow deep and, and, and into the soil, are secreting all those molecules fuels of life to feed the rhizosphere, the, the soil microbiome. But plants feed from their leaves. And it's really important to get this across. It's not about buying chemicals, fertilizers, putting their roots. It's about having maximizing leaf area. If you have a look at this picture, the more the leaves are cut, the less roots there are. Because what is happening, when you cut the leaves now, it no longer has the, the organic molecules to feed its roots. Plants are smart. Instead of saying, oh, we no longer have enough to feed the roots, we'll starve every root and then we'll, we'll die. They go, 
you have to shed off excess roots and just keep enough roots so they're in balance. So when when the leaves are cut, plants shed roots. So if you have a look at where where um, on on the far left hand side, and you see the plant where the leaves are cut the most, and most of those roots are shed, think about the amount of organic material now from the roots that it had now that that have been shed, and now the the microbes are breaking that down and releasing all that nutrient into the soil. So by growing crops, in this case, we particularly cover crops, and you don't have to kill them. Just by cutting the leaves, we can get the, the roots shed and feed the system. This is really good information here on the percentage of leaves that if we just cut 50% of the leaves, the roots do not stop growing. And this is really important if we're, if we're talking about grazing at our grazing system. If we just come in and just quickly allow them in and, and just take 50% of the leaves and then allow them to recover, they won't lose roots. They will recover very quickly. The more we graze it, the more roots they, they lose and the longer they take to recover. But just just see if I yeah. what I want to show here is how we can actually now use this in perennial systems now or in cover crop systems and start getting rid of this ten thousand year old Neolithic mythology that any plant that is not our crop is a weed and needs to be nuked. We have to spray it out or plow it out and start thinking of how we can actually have our cash crop, the one we earn money off, and the cover crop is the one that we use to build soil fertility for our cash crop. And what I want to show you here is that we, we can actually keep a cover crop, a live cover crop. If we keep those leaves short, our cash crop has access to the sunlight, because, because it's taller, and remember what we're talking about, 95% of a crop's fertility, biomass, comes from sunlight, carbon dioxide from the air, and water. And because the cover crop has been, the leaves have been cut short, its roots are shorter, our cash crop's roots are deeper into the ground, so they're getting the water and the nutrients as well. And by continuously letting the, the cover crop grow and cut it back, we're actually recycling those nutrients and feeding our cash crop. So th this is what my farm looks like at the moment. And, and uh, it's the end of the season now. I, I, I won't... won't take my tractor out when, when the soils are wet because I don't want to compact them and I like them to dry out. And my neighbours look at my farm at the moment and think, oh, this is the worst farmer in the district. He's just let it go out of control. Look at those weeds, you know. Terrible, terrible farmer I am. What they, that they see weeds, what I see is uh, a cover crop three metres tall of legumes and, and, and perennial grasses. It's taller than, than me on my tractor. And actually what I prefer to do rather than go through it in my tractor is graze it down and use that as, um, convert that into uh, beef. It's a wonderful high protein feed and cut that down because the trees around it are, are, are fruit trees. So. What this is what my place will look like after it's cut down in the dry season as a cover crop. And when you look at that, that amount of biomass I've got there, it's bigger than my tractor. When that is all mowed down, all those roots get shed down into the soil. I'm building fertility. So in my place, this, this, these are the figures. What I did in 11 years, I went from 1% organic matter, less than 1% it actually was, 
to uh, over 6%. Some places is up to 9%, but I, I'd say an average of 6 I increased my uh, total exchange capacity, which is the best way to say is it's like the fuel tank of nutrients for your crop. But what you can see there also, if you look at the nutrients, how much I increased my nitrogen, calcium, magnesium, potassium, phosphorus. Now, I didn't go and buy all that and put that in. The biology did that. And the reason I wanted to show that picture, you can actually see one of the roots. It's one of the legumes I use called Pinto Pino, the deep-rooted legume. I've dug down to three metres and I gave up because I just don't know how deep it goes. After three metres, I thought that was enough for me. I knew it was pretty deep. But what you can see there, why I wanted to show you that, you can see the rhizosphere. You can see as as that root is growing into the subsoil, you can see the carbon forming around it. The biology now is turning that subsoil into topsoil and it's deepening. And this is one of the reasons why deep rooted perennial legumes are just so good for building source. A friend of mine, and I think probably one of, one of the world's greatest farmers, innovative farmers, Cole Seiss, and someone who's really worth listening to and what he's done is so innovative is the concept of pasture cropping where he sows grains into perennial pastures rather than plowing them up and spraying them up and fertilizing them and the yields he gets now are as good as his colleagues who are who are spending a fortune on fertilizers and herbicides and diesel to plow up all he needs to do is put modified no-till systems through the the um, pasture after it's been grazed down with holistic management and he gets a good crop of oats after the head has gone through guess what he's got perennial pasture he put the sheep back on so he can get double income off off it but really importantly is this work that dr christine jones did on cole's place and just to explain that the farm, it's a family farm and Cole and his brother inherited it. And uh, basically these are taken from the same paddock. A fence has put, been put down between. One brother has used standard, um, you know, fixed stocking grazing and Cole's has used his uh, pasture uh, cropping and you can just see the difference in coals the deep organic matter as you go deep down how much he's increased it and the deep organic matter is the stable organic matter and organic carbon is key why because these are organic molecules the sugars the carbohydrates these are the molecules of life that feed the soil microbes. As a result, you can see um, the increase in nutrients. You know, calcium 177%, magnesium 38, potassium 46%, uh, sulfur, phosphorus 51%. He started off putting a little bit of phosphorus on the system because, as we know, most Aussie soils are pretty low in phosphorus just to get it going. But most of that phosphorus now has actually been released from the locked up phosphorus. And so despite the fact he's taking two cash crops off, meat and grains, everybody's saying, oh, no, it'd be exporting nutrients. The biology has increased the nutrients. He's increased the fertility so he doesn't have to waste money buying it in and bringing it in. The other one I want to talk about, and we'll go into more detail, a whole session on this, is how by using these regenerative systems, getting cell health and bringing in what we call functional biodiversity, we can control all our pests and diseases. And this is wheat grown in Ethiopia, and uh, it's a trial. One side is based on good chemical practices, good fertilization with, um, with chemical fertilizers. 
and the other side they've they used compost to build up soil health in other words build up the soil organic matter and the wheat it's been a wasn't the best season it's been a bit overcast and 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 and, and light rain and everything and they've got rust so you can see the the the, the, the wheat from chemicals it's 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 not 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 as big you can actually see it's a lighter color it's infected with rust the, the the wheat grown with the compost looks so much healthier darker green it's taller you know, it's the same soil it's the same climate the same level of of of, of um spore of you know rust spore in the atmosphere the difference is management so the you know, the, the wheat grown with chemical fertilizers had to be sprayed with fungicides, otherwise they wouldn't have got any crop. And despite that, they got 1.6 tonnes per hectare. And the wheat grown with compost gave 6.5 tonnes per hectare. And we have a lot of data like this. Now, I think this is one of the things I want to get across here is that Everybody says, oh, you know, you're going to lose yield. It's the other way around. We can increase yield and re substantially reduce the costs on how to get this yield. And I just want to end with this. This is the last slide, and then we can start opening with um, questions. This is my own farm. Uh, I, I grow tropical fruits and uh, I grow papayas. And we have, uh, a, in a lot of, it affects a lot of tropical fruits, fruit spotting bug. And if you look at the lower part of the papaya, you can see the damage. It completely destroys the crops. And for many years, um, people who grow um, well, a lot of crops, lychees, avocados, um, mangoes, and so on, and macadamias ha have fought fought to keep endosulfan, the last of the DDT group of chemicals, to uh, kill it, saying it's the only way you can do it. You can see on my place where it's been infected and damaged by this insect, and now you can look up and you can see that it's healthy now and it's setting papayas. I didn't spray anything, not even organic sprays. I fixed up the soil. Whenever I see uh, crop damage, my first response is fix up the soil, in particular the soil organic matter, and get that working. And that, that believe me, that that will solve solve nine percent of your problems. And later on, we can talk about other ways of bringing in functional biodiversity to solve the rest. So you don't even have to use. Uh, organic sprays. We can we can let the the biology, the ecology, do the work for us. So I'll finish there with my as my last slide, and then open up the open up for questions. Awesome. Thank you very much for that, Andre. Um, it seems like you've got, or well, it is not seems you do have a wealth of knowledge, and I love the fact that you've also travelled around a lot of the world. Um, I, I've got a quick question that comes up a lot in our community. Um, um, <clears throat> people often want to know, when it comes to regenerative farming, can you apply this globally or do people need to find farmers in their local area? Um, and just I just thought because you have been someone who's travelled a lot and seen farms from all around the world in some of your examples in your presentation, what's your take on uh, learning from people all around the world uh, you, you know, is soil science and it's the same everywhere or does localised climate matter? Yeah, okay. Uh, as you're right, I, I, up until recently, <laughs> I, 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 I'm on every continent, or every arable continent. It's not much point if you're into farming to go to Antarctica. But, and I meet with farmers at every scale. So from you know, people who have got thousands and thousands of hectares through to people who have got, you know, not, not even a hectare, you know, just, just uh, 
you know, some, some very, um, you know, few acres. And you can do it at every scale. And I think one of the really important things here is that we're not talking about this idea of the simple recipe. We're talking about, you know, end of the day, our climates, our microclimates, our soils, our farms are different. So everybody needs to actually work out what is best for them. And that might take some time. However, really importantly, there are general principles to start with. And that's what I want to really, you know, that, that's what I'm doing at the moment. This particular series is to do with general principles, which can be applied to anyone's farm at any point. Then as, we, as you talk about specific crops, specific climates, then you need to bring in, in another layer of knowledge. But can I say it's being done everywhere. There's no problem that has not been solved. And this is the really important thing. There's probably ways with research we can do it better. And I, I'm a great believer in research and science, particularly what I call participatory research, where we get um, scientists and researchers and farmers and researchers together and do it on farm. But I just want to say there's nothing to stop anyone from starting. Perfect. And I think that's um, a really good um, good point as well, is that even if there isn't a lot of local support, you can become that local support. You know, grab all the information and then others can lean on, on you. Um, so we've got quite a few questions streaming in, so we might just jump in into them um, and we'll try and keep the responses quite tight. Um, but when you were talking about cover cropping, which is a, a common technique, um, to, to cover the soil and protect it and armour it. Uh, a lot of people were asking why cutting, uh, like you, you made a cutting um, as opposed to like rolling or grazing. Is there a better approach uh, and is there one needed at a certain time? Okay. Um, I just used the example of cutting, but rolling and grazing do, do exactly the same. When I'm talking about, you know, when you roll and you crimp the leaves, it's now the leaves um, start to die and they don't um, send the products of photosynthesis, the molecules of life to feed the roots. So, you know, a crimper roller, um, grazing and eating them or a tractor and slasher, lawnmower, um, a machete, <laughs> whatever suits, whatever you want to do, putting geese on. You know, what I used to use years ago here was mostly geese because I had an orchard and when I had smaller trees but in the end unfortunately we got uh, wild dogs and so um, the one thing about cattle is that they are a bit bigger and, and you know a lot 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 better but you know it's it's it, you know you can why I, I want to just mention geese is that or, or chickens is that you, you can add animals in at any scale. It's, mm. it's up to you how you want to do it. And there's so many, llamas, whatever, you know, uh, emus. <laughs> there are so many that we can do to, 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 to do our systems. And, you know, I, I, I know people have done some really interesting cover crop systems where when I showed the, the, the cash crop and, you know, the little image of the... the um, cover crop in between you know in, in the rows between the cash crop they just mm. ran their lawnmower down and uh, do it that way you know just just to hand you know the old four stroke lawnmower um it, 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 one way is that by rethinking the system you don't you can use your existing whatever you've got you don't need to go out and buy a whole lot of new equipment to become regenerative mm. yeah in most cases people start selling their equipment because they don't need to sit on a tractor and till and uh, and so forth. So definitely yeah. a good point. Uh, another question here, um, I know we have people from all different landscapes. And so Wendy's ask around improving rocky soil, like what deep root perennials are suitable for, for building uh, organic matter around rocky soil areas? Okay, where, where is she? I'm just, there's 
deep root perennials for every climate apart from Antarctica. Yep. So, you know, one, one of my favourites for most of Australia is lucent, alfalfa, they call it. Um, it's a beautiful, deep-rooted, long-lasting perennial, you know. Um, then, um, you know, well, some of the annuals I love, you know, um, vetches are just brilliant for um, winter growing, you know, uh, over rocky soils and then, then dying off, you know, uh, in spring, summer, you know, just that there, there are just so many species that, 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 that we can use for our systems. Yep. Yep. And so if Wendy, you're still on the line, my, my feel case. free to share where you're up from as well. Yeah. Yeah. Look, in my case, I have a lot of tropical perennials, um, you know, a lot of people regard them as weeds, but, you know, since what we're trying to do is the more biomass we get, the more leaf area we've got, that's more organic matter or molecules of life, the more fertility we put into our system. So end of the day, the worse the weed, the better it is for our system because we've got more organic matter. It's about the appropriate management system. And there's always an appropriate management system. Yeah. That's right. And talking about like organic matter and so forth, Gihard is joined joined us today. Hello, Gihard. Um, I, he wants to know like what levels of organic matter are, are necessary to achieve uh, good soil health. Um, what you know, yeah, what biology is needed to sustain this health as well. Um, so, in your opinion, what, what would your comments be on that? Okay. Um, look, uh, I, I, I'd like to say a range of between th 3 and 6%. Now, you can get much higher than 6%. And, uh, you know, but between 3 and 6 is achievable very easily. And will work well, you know, and, and, and I think what you find too, it depends on the system, you know, with the system I've got at the moment. Um, so, so what happens, each system fi finds a new equal equilibrium. It depends on your soil and your climate. Where I am, it seems 6% seems to be the equilibrium. Year after year, after I test, I've now reached 6% when I started at less than one. I know other people who are getting 9%. Other people, you know, find it difficult to get past three, you know, if they've got sandy soils or, or whatever. But if you can get it up to three, you know, the science shows that and the other evidence that the system will work well. Awesome, awesome. Um, Helen, I might ask one more question and then hand it over to you. Um, actually, I'm going to answer this question because a few people have been asking if it's recording. Um, and yes, the recording button is live. And if everything works well, we will get a replay out to everyone. Uh, Andre, people are also asking whether they can get copies of your slides. Are you happy to, to share that after the yeah, presentation? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yep. Awesome. Yep. Awesome. Uh, I'll, I'll send you a PDF with it and uh, everybody's welcome to have it. Perfect. Fantastic. Well, I'll throw over to Helen and uh, you can ask some more questions, a, a Helen. A couple of... Um, <laughs> Sorry, I just wanted to say a couple of questions. Uh, Diana Rose would say, suggest anything from John Kemp, Gay Brown, and Ray Archuleta, and I'd like to fully agree that, that their books and their information are, are really good. You know, so yeah. Yeah, there's some and, excellent references. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And um, for Wendy from Canna, uh, Canna Windra, yeah, definitely try Tagasaki and Weeping Mile, Caribs, etc. There, there are so many. And there are actually, you know, a lot of our native wattle species are really good perennial deep-rooted legumes. And a lot of them actually make um, good high-protein cattle feed, stock feed as well, you know, for sheep and animals. So, you know, we actually have a lot of good native systems. Uh, um, species that we can use as perennial deep-rooted legumes and we can manage them and use them uh, 
the pods and the leaves as high protein feed. Yada and tillage radish, someone's asked about uh, helping with compaction. So that would be one I'd toss yeah, in. Mm. Yeah, tillage radish is just brilliant for, for breaking up compacted soils. Couldn't mm. agree more. We had a vegetable grower who used to leave his carrots in over winter too, and they'd grow, they were huge, you know, but it was the same sort of effect mm. as the tillage radish too. Yeah. Um, so people are asking in, in to, tropical areas yeah grow grow taro and um uh, gingers like 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 uh, turmeric and those uh, they grow over the wet season and they're brilliant for opening up wet clay soils mm, wonderful i wish we could grow ginger out here but we can't too wet <laughs> Um, people are also asking about getting more information. We'll be running more of, of these sessions, so hang around us. We've got lots that we can share with you. And Andre also um, has some DVDs and books. Um, these are about not directly on regen farming, but on about, well, they are really. It's really saying the, the yeah. result of not regen. Um, is toxic foods and, and your soil not being healthy. So I just want to toss those in because Andre has done so much research and if you need convincing, um, have a look at his, his work, go on his Twitter channel and things like that because you're very, very generous and passionate about your sharing, Andre, and I really want to emphasise that. You're right in there and here you are at home and you still can't get up to the farm to keep up with everything because you're serving the world and you've been around serving the world. I don't know what started your passion, but it is um, just awesome, truly awesome. And it's so I'm just suggesting people stick around us. We will help people. I see you, Jane, from Romania. We've been exchanging for a while. He wants to start teaching this and you, Jane, We'll support you. We really want to get this out too. And Romania is very much threatened with um, chemicals and things now. I remember Jerry Brunetti talking about going there to stop the chemicals being used in farming. And it's, we'd really like to help you on that journey as well. And I'm sure um, Andre would help in that too. So um, we've just all got to get together. It really is so much about community now. And the opportunity now is to really start starting with your own community, getting together um, with food, your thinking, everything to start sharing and supporting each other. And now's the time where a lot of people are forced now to learn Zoom because their children aren't at school here now. And parents have been forced into this technology, which is brilliant because it allows us all to get together so easily. So I just want to pop that in. Um, so if any more questions come in, um, let's have a look. Uh, testing. Comment on continual testing, Andre, for soil, microbes, tissue analysis, etc. cetera. Um, would you comment on that, please? Okay. Look, <laughs> I think in the beginning, it is really good to do these tests to get an idea of how your um, soils are tracking. Because, you know, I suppose what I'm, I'm trying to get across is fertility is a biological process. It's not a chemi, you know, we're taught it's a chemical process, but it's the biology that releases these nutrients from the soil. And testing is really important. One, to actually, you know, I'm a great believer in soil tests to see, see what the nutrients are doing because, you know, even in my climate here, um, I, I, need, I, I know I need to periodically put on, on boron because I've got a really high you know, rainfall. We, we get an average of three metres a year. And testing is a really important tool. Also, because what we're talking about, you know, 
the what I was trying to show the increase in, in nutrients in my place and Cole's place, it wasn't because we, we saw tested and then we went and bought all those nutrients and put it on. It's because we got the biology right. We fed the biology through photosynthesis. But now, you know, through, through modern testing, we can actually have a look at the type of biology, what's in it, and, and then make decisions on how to monitor it. Do we want a, a bacterial dominated or a fungal dominated? These are, you know, tools that we have now. And that's why I, I do, particularly in the beginning, recommend testing. You'll find, in my case and others, after, <laughs> after the decades go past, you reach an equilibrium and really you don't need to do that much testing. I know every time I test here, I know what my results are before I do the test. Things have not changed in yeah. 20 years. Yeah. I've got an equilibrium. So, but in the beginning, it is critical. Yeah. And Andre, the other thing that Gerhard's trust in here too, and we would say as well, is visually observe your soil. There are simple ways that you can see whether oh, your soil yeah. is healthy with um, yep. compaction, infiltration, where you, whether you've got worms, ants and things like that. So Gerhard is asking, have you met many people looking at using visual soil assessment, assessment before going to a laboratory? The answer is yes, and it's one of the things I normally teach people. I, I just think it's critical um, visual and also, um, yeah, and actually feeling it, you know, telling, teaching people how to actually feel it and, and look at it, smell it. Um, smell tells you so much. Mm -hmm. and, and for me, I tell people the other one, you know, the footsteps of the farmer is the best fertilizer. Walk it. You'll actually feel the difference. One day your, your place changes. And I'll never forget it here on this farm. And suddenly I was walking over this soft carpet. The soil mm. had changed from, from, from when I first got here, I, I used to have to use a crowbar to plant things. It was so hard. Couldn't even use a shovel. And, yep. and then yep. it's as, the, as, as it comes to life and, and, and the soil gets aerated and the biology does it, you're suddenly walking over this beautiful soft carpet of soil. And yeah. I can't tell you, it, it just sort of like changes overnight. So well, the Andre, biology kicks in and bang. We, we've actually been on a farm walk with Mark and Stapper and I can always remember it because they were doing biological, they were testing whether they should change across from using chemicals. And they were testing and we started in um, the paddock that was, um, you know, being changed over and was like a normal paddock for me, you know, like you could dig it and you could look at the roots and everything else. And then we went across to the control paddock. That was what they were doing, and they're still doing for most of the farm. We got the spade out to have a look at the soil, and I can still hear it in my ears, the tinging like metal on the soil. It was so hard, and Martin was jumping on the shovel to try and get it in. You know, it was just so compacted. And I, we just giggled. And I, I, it still didn't convince the farmer to leave his... You know, to immediately say, well, look, it's obvious. I've got to go to the biological side. It still took a, a lot more time, didn't it, with her mm. to move things mm. across. So, you know, you'd think seeing is believing, wouldn't you, on the same farm? But it yeah. was like, No, you, you, know, just need, you just need a bigger it. tractor, more horsepower. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of farmers actually admit to us they never get off the tractor. You know, and it's, it's so, so valuable asking these questions about knowing your soil and how you can learn. And we do have seven steps to healthy soils free on our website. Some Ray might find the link to put up if you don't know where to start with checking your soil. It's it's just great. You know, kids love doing it too, you know. Not so good a time in winter. I, 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 yep. Yeah. Sorry. I, I'm a great believer in what I call the uh, dirt under fingernails approach. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know. I, I I like the fact um, of being probably the only person when I'm on an aeroplane, I've, I've got dirt under my fingernails and I'm quite proud of it because <laughs> I know Very it's cool. uh, <laughs> from my soil. Yeah, yeah. And it's great for exchanging microbes, 
earthing the whole lot, all yeah. the binoculars are there. Now, my, I'm getting back. Oh, there's Especially been a couple. Now. Of, yeah, yeah. Sure. I'm getting back to a couple of questions earlier on compost um, and humic and fulvic acids. So I'll roll them all together. All applicants, what do you or additions to the soil? Would you like to comment on mm. their use, please? Yeah. Look. Look. In the beginning, these can be when we talk about regenerating dead soils, these can be really useful tools for kick-starting the process. And, you know, and, and, and you'll, you, you can start getting results very quickly. Once you've actually got the soils going, you don't need to because that, the, um, the biology is producing so many much humic acid and ormic, formic acid and ormic acid. They're actually, um, th these acids are a bit like snowflakes. They're, 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 there's technically millions of them in combinations of all these organic acids. And if you're getting that biology happening, getting that biomass, the, um, it's the biology that creates these acids from the organic matter. You don't need to buy it, you know, when, 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 when you're actually putting in technically, you know, thousands of tonnes of organic matter as we're growing it, buying a few kilos is like adding a pebble to a rock slide. It's a waste of money. But in the beginning, when the soils are dead, it's a wonderful way to kickstart the process. Yeah. Okay, great. We have a specific question, uh, Andre, that's come in from Ingrid. She's in Gibson, Victoria. She has an acid rat root mat issue on some sandy loam paddocks. What would you suggest um, re-perennials to break it up? At the moment, nothing will germinate in it. Okay, all right. Look, in this case, I'm a great believer in um, the Albrecht system of uh, soil balance. You know, well, you know, while, while I was talking about the 95%, the 5% in the soil is also critical in actually getting that nutrient balance right. And, you know, I would get a soil test first, have a look at that and start looking at how to balance it. Believe me, once you start to do that, you will find that it will change and you'll be able to now grow um, deep-rooted perennials to break it up. But to me, when I look at that, that that is a soil that is out of balance, and you know, getting the right minerals in in the beginning to to balance it will kickstart the process. What about I'm just thinking because she's done in Gibson with Niels Olsen's um, soil key, disturbing the soil, just tickling the soil. Would things like that help? Look, it would because it'll aerate it and break it up. And soil key is very good, and um, for exactly that. And I've seen some really good examples in Gippsland um, of breaking up the acid root mass, particularly in um, some of the best ones I've seen is you know in, in soils that get waterlogged in winter in Gippsland and get go sour, and opened it up. So that would work well. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd still, um, you know, and they'll get the biology going and the biology yeah. will, will over time fix up the uh, nutrient issue. But I, I, I would still, you know, if it's me and my, my property, I would get a soil test and have a look at it and, and, and see what needs to be balanced because, you know, I found here with my place, I struggled. And the moment I learned actually through Gary Zimmer in the US how to do it, everything changed overnight here. That's actually when I, I, I give the story when I suddenly walk on my place and it's this soft carpet. It happened so quickly once I'd got the mineral balance right. And from then onwards, you know, I started doing soil tests and my nutrients just started increasing because because getting the, fixing up the, you know, the deficiencies stimulates the biology because the biology also needs these minerals just like the plants yeah. do. 
Yeah, and like our bodies, as you know, balancing. And like mind. our bodies, exactly. It's, it's the same rule across the board for all of us. Mm. Andre, We're all this living is, entities, and this. Yeah, we are. To, we are. To, to, <laughs> Uh, someone specific, the soil. Yes, that's right. Um, as someone's asked here specifically whether you have any issues with myrtle rust up there, and if so, how do you deal with it? Okay. Um, yeah. Look, myrtle rust is everywhere in Australia now, and it's uh, unfortunately it's going to take a while for it to adapt. The what what is happening already in Australia is that you know as long as we've got good biodiversity, we're finding that that there are varieties of our natives and also um, other myrtaceae that are grown as crops that are resistant to it. And I think the thing is to be selecting the resistant ones is is the long term one. The other issue with myrtle rust and uh, what people have found once again is getting that soil health. Healthy plants resist diseases better than um, deficient and sick plants. It makes yeah. a huge difference. And then on top of that, what you can do is use some of the um, organically allowed um, fungicides, say um, wettable sulfur is a good one. The um, one, one of the ones that works really well for molds and rusts are milk products. Yeah. Just, um, you know, old yogurt, just mix up powdered milk and spray that out. Another one that is really good is just baking soda. Mm. Change the pH. Um, yeah. And the, the key is not to just use one, because what happens is, you know, the, these microorganisms are just brilliant to quickly building up resistance. So you, you use a range of strategies. So if you, one, one, one week you spray sulfur, the week after that or two weeks after that, spray milk, then after that, um, spray baking powder or, or, or you know, a, a very good is actually um, sodium, uh, potassium bicarbonate, uh, baking powder, sodium bicarbonate, potassium bicarbonate is even better and, and the mm. plant gets the potassium. And then go back after that because that's alkaline and then um, spray sulfur, which is acid. And it just makes it really hard for the, um, the uh, rusts and molds to adapt they never get it they never get a break yep okay great but Let's start go. with soil health start yep. with, you know i showed you the picture why i wanted to show you the picture of the wheat with rust rust is a big issue in many yeah. crops different rusts and you could see that you know that the healthy crop was not affected by the rust or the you know the, the amount of damage was so minuscule that it's not considered economic yeah no that's great um we're going to have to close very soon um a couple of things people want to know where they can get your book we can help with that we do have some copies here and we even have some signed copies if you want to buy from karmic secrets um but suggest that you look online if it's um if you're overseas because of the cost of postage. Um, but Ray, it is time, isn't it, to start winding up? Okay. Um, well, there's just one thing I wanted to bring here, and that's your mate, Ronnie Cummins from Regeneration Ag Agriculture, that way, um, has released this book, Grassroots Rising. It's about all of us. It's a call to action for all of us. And Andre, if I may, I'd like to read the quote you have put in this book. And I think then we may finish on that and let Ray Ray let you know about more about how to listen to you again. So what Andre has written here is, I'm going to put my glasses on. <laughs> um, he's talking about grassroots rising. It's one of the most important books you'll ever read. 
it shows the existential environmental and health disasters caused by toxic and degenerative practices of the poison cartels, big agriculture, the fossil fuel industries, predator tycoons and the money manipulators. Most importantly though, it is a book with good news. It outlines the logical and very achievable pathway for how we can shift from degeneration to regeneration and make this a healthy, fair, prosperous, diverse, democratic and environmentally robust world for all of us. We'd like to invite you to join us on this journey. And well said, Andre, and thank you. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's been an absolute delight um, hanging out with everyone. Um, you know, this is really what Farming Secrets has been all about. I've just popped up some text in the chat. Um, we do have a Farming Secrets Facebook community group, and it's for all people who value uh, their soil. And so that is free, and that's where you can keep asking questions. Uh, not only do the Farming Secrets group hang out there, but um, there is a large number of a growing community of other farmers who may even be in your area that can definitely um, help out. And then we also have a heap of YouTube videos and articles on our blog. So um, I'll pop those links up in the chat. Um, the formatting has disappeared, but um, you can kind of see them there. And we'll send that in our email with the replay of this, this webinar as, as well. Um, one of the things that we have definitely um, realized is that community and support is, um, is a big thing. And one of the things I've been experiencing a lot lately is that people ask, uh, people are, are telling me that they feel really alone and confused. And so I'm just going to publish a poll at the moment. Um, and uh, I'm not sure how this comes up uh, on, on the screen or so forth, but we'd love for you to vote whether you are someone who feels alone and confused when it comes to regenerative agriculture. Uh, Andre, keen to know your thoughts. Do you feel that a lot of people feel like they're battling this alone or have we gone past that tipping point? I think a lot. When people first move towards any new paradigm and that includes regenerative agriculture, a lot of people feel like they're alone and it is one of the, the reasons why it makes it difficult for people to change. It's not only they feel alone, but they feel like they're going to be the butt of ridicule. And so it is important yeah. that people can be part of communities. And one of the best ones, are online communities like, like you know, your Facebook community. It's a great place to start to meet other people. If you've got a problem, you can talk with other people and they can tell you what their experience is. And for me, finding these online communities is the way to go. And there are so many of them around the world. There are hundreds of them. And there'll be online communities that will be just right for you. Just look. But I'd suggest start with uh, the Farming Secret ones. Best place to start today. Awesome. Too rough. Awesome. <laughs> we agree. Um, <laughs> and I'm, I'm just about to close the poll. So if you haven't voted uh, too bad, uh, there will be another one in a minute. Um, but we got a very mixed response. It's almost 50 50. So it's really nice to know that people are starting to come out of that space of, uh, of feeling uh, alone and so forth. Um, my, other, my other kind of question that I wanted to ask everyone, just as a food for thinking, is do you feel that your farm has? a huge potential and uh, the possibility to grow and expand. And are you not tapping into that potential? One of the things I've found recently is that people know what the right thing to do is. They know what they want to do. The intentions are correct, but they just get stuck on the how. Um, so I'm curious to know, do you feel like you have more potential to give from your farm and you're not really tapping into that? Uh, Andre, we, with some of the case studies, what have you seen people being able to achieve by going through this? Um, and how long does it normally take to get through that, that, that process? You can start the first day, seriously. And like I said, you don't need to buy any new equipment. And it, it's just changing your mindset. What I always advise people is don't change your whole farm at once, but just find a small area and don't go with your worst land. You don't want to set yourself up for failure. Don't get mm. your best land. You don't want to um, make it too easy. And just start experimenting. You know, there's, and 
think about what you have learned and what applies to what you're doing now and just start to work there because whenever we, we do something new, we will make mistakes. That's the nature of learning. But that's how we learn. We, you know, never be frightened to make mistakes. We learn from it. You think, well, what went wrong? How do I do it better? And you will get it right. And once you're confident, you've got a thing going, you start scaling it up. And the other one I want to say too is, is the mindset of continuous improvement. Always think about what you're doing and how can I do it better every Absolutely. year, all the time. You know, this, this, this is the way to go. And we learn, you will learn, you'll, you, you'll become your own pioneer, your own researcher. And the one thing I want to say is if someone's had a lifetime of farming, I started 50 years ago next year, that, you know, this is the thing that gives you the most joy. Rather than just being a labourer on your own farm, you are now your own scientist on your own farm. And it makes farming so exciting. You know, like I said, 50 years, and I still love it. I love every day I get up and out in my farm because of it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think we've hit a bit of a nerve because um, a lot of people responded on this uh, on this poll and it was really exciting um, to see that 90% of people say that, yes, they feel that they've got more potential to um, grow and expand their farm and feel stuck. So that's really interesting insights. And I really um, appreciate everyone participating in those polls. It really gives us a good understanding to know where you're at. Um, and also the reason why we do these polls is to make you stop and think about that as well, because, you know, after this webinar, it's about the action that you go and take. Um, it's about buying that book. It's about watching that YouTube video. It's about, you know, talking to your community. Um, every little thing that you do matters. And so if you've got this inkling that you've got more potential to give from your farm, um, you know, consider sharing the land, consider collaborating, consider stacking other enterprises. There's lots of different ways. Explore starting a farm gate or selling direct and mess it up. I love your your point of continual learning because that's what I live my life by um, is the, you know, to stay sharp is kind of what I say. Um, it's about that continual learning and not being afraid to fail. And I think farmers are very um experimental and are not afraid to fail but do it more often and uh, experiment and become true leaders in your own community because uh, like the name of our business farming secrets we want to share those secrets that you're doing on your farm to the world uh, that's how we we make change and um an impact now i am conscious of time um and i really you know want to thank andre for coming on today uh, you're more than welcome to stick around but i wanted to invite everyone who's attended today um, and still with us. If you want to find out more on how you can hang out with Farming Secrets um, and also Andre, because we've been working with him uh, for a very long time and we have a program in our, uh, in our what we call the, the Farming Secrets Circle website. And uh, if you're interested to find out a little bit more about that, you're more than welcome to stick back and um, I can show you around that very leanly. Um, we don't want the intent of this webinar to be a sales pitch or anything like that. It's uh, more a lot of value. And uh, if you've gotten that value already, uh, you know, this is technically the end, end of the, the webinar. Um, and we, we thank you, Andre, for, for coming on and sharing your wisdom. And I do believe we have some extra uh, webinars or in, uh, events in the next couple of weeks. So uh, everyone watch your space because we will let you know about that. We've been able to get Andre's attention given the current uh, economy and not being able to fly around. So we're very grateful for you dedicating some additional time with hanging out with our community. Yeah. I'd just like, there's two comments quickly before you say goodbye. Uh, someone asked if, if I'd go to Argentina and the answer is when we're allowed to fly again, I'd look forward to returning to Argentina. And the other comment about uh, Bandana Shiva is that Vandana is one of the um, founders of Regeneration International, you know, she, and she's one of the leaders of this movement. Mm, wonderful woman. Awesome. Along with Ronnie Cummings. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Well, Andre, thank you very much. Um, you're more than welcome to stick around and like anyone else, but otherwise, you know, we will say goodbye. This is where we'll cut the recording so uh, for the there. replay. <laughs> no worries. Appreciate your time. Thank you okay. and uh, enjoy the time on your farm. Yeah.
Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Ciao. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Ciao. Excellent. Excellent. And for everyone else, I do have one more poll that's interactive um, and you might want to enjoy joining on this one here. Um, I want to know, do you spend too much time looking for answers on Facebook, YouTube uh, uh, and uh, in groups and Google? Because um, I know with everything in my life, I spend way too much researching and probably not taking uh, enough action. So I just want to get a sense of the room if everyone's a little bit like me. I think it's a bit you know, human nature. Helen and Hugo, do you spend too much time Googling and YouTubing and Facebooking uh, for look, answers? It, it is fantastic at times if you want a specific thing, but when you get down this curly channel of wanting to know how to do things, unless you happen to find a YouTube little short thing, yeah, a long time, too much time. Yeah. I haven't got the time, yeah. you know, I'd rather <laughs> I know. go to someone. <laughs> I do think Absolutely. you need a quality. I do think you need a quality mentor, really. Um, yeah. And yeah. Absolutely. Gabe and Bounce, I think. Yeah. Gabe well, Brown I, got, said, I got the books out before. Yeah. Yeah. As Gabe Brown said, if your uh, consultant isn't into biological pharma, sack him. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, it's just people don't know what they don't know. So they're going to give you the best advice of what they understand. And that's why sometimes researching things on the Internet can be a bit confusing because it's not that they don't, they're wrong. They just don't know. I, I, I can only advise with what I'm strong at, you know, that's marketing and business and, and, and all this, you know, um, space. But it's, um, you know, I can't go with outside that field. So I might give an opinion for something outside of that. Um, but the results are in and uh, 75, oh, it just changed in the last minute. 80% of people feel like they spend way too much time um, on YouTube and Google and Facebook researching. Um, and I think that's why it's really important to get around like-minded people, people who understand where you're coming from, they live with the same intentions. Um, and community is a really big part and something that we've been working really hard on with, with Farming Secrets because we realised that... Um, people were doing it a little bit alone and I know that's kind of shifting now which is great to see but I speak to a lot of people every week where they say I'm just lost I'm stuck I speak to my you know even family members who are maybe doing it differently who they get a lot of resistance so they don't even feel supported by their family so um in Facebook we've got a a, a members group which is called the fence pay fence post and that's kind of like our virtual fence post we wanted to create this kind of sense that you can go to the fence post and talk to your neighbour who happens to be on the other side of the world. Um, and so um, I just get a feel um, of people in the room. Would, would everyone like me to share a little bit more about the program that uh, Andre Loy has developed with Farming Secrets? And um, just put a yes in the comment of the chat um, because I won't spend time talking about it if no one's really uh, interested in this. Um, okay, well, yep. Good. All right. Well, that's there is a good response. So I, I think we'll, we'll, we'll jump into it. I'll just um, I, I tried to load some screens while uh, Andre was was chatting, um, and so this will be a little bit rough and and, and lean. Um, let's have a look. I'll just share my screen here. Um, share screen. Um, where is it? Okay, so hopefully you can see my screen now. Um, so this is the Regenerative Ag Workshop with Andre Loy. So it's um, a complete online course that takes you through the whole journey of regenerative farming. Um, I'll just double check you can see my screen, yep. Um, and so these are the lesson breakouts and so forth. So I'll just expand them all. Um, it, it will take you through, uh, you know, regenerative farming, why, why we need to do this. Um, cost-effective ways that you can build organic soil health and organic matter. Um, and each, each lesson and topic includes a video. We even have some quizzes for some of the lessons and we're, we're building out, you know, the, the course to be as interactive as possible with feedback from students. One of the things that we've really realised is that people want accountability. They want to commit to something and say, in the next three months, I want to, you know, explore no-till. I want to explore cover cropping. Or I need to get my pests and disease down. So we want to work with you to to get that that sorted. Um, 
you know, pest and disease, which Andre also alluded to in the chat before, can be achieved by building resilience in your crop and your soil health. And um, this module here would, would take you through that. Uh, weeds, ground cover, um, cover cropping, um, a whole uh, things about whether weeds are friends or foe. You know, the weeds normally tell you something about what's happening in the ground beneath our feet. So it's really important, um, as we spoke about in the webinar before, to be an observer of the land and know what that weed means and what your response to that should be. Um, and so managing your weeds and weeds are really is this kind of man-made concept of like a plant that's not in its desired place. So weeds shouldn't really exist as a word. Um, it's just if it's in the wrong place. But if Mother Nature is putting it there, it's normally a signal or a reason for why for why it's there. So um, um, yeah, and so we and then also going into holistic grazing and pasture management uh, and so forth. So that's a little peek into what the the course is about and this is actually in our farming secret circle website um so we have heaps of different farm tours and experts that you can work with um bonuses and gold nuggets there's there's a lot of content i won't go into that detail with you today um helen i believe there's also an extra bonus that is included in this course as well yes on climate resilience Excellent. So that was an extra video that we recorded with Andre. And so because yeah. we have years um, of content, we can pop that in uh, as well. And um, one extra thing, and what we were talking about with Andre before, is that um, we have been able to secure Andre to take this, take a group of students through a live coaching, um, a, a life coaching experience. So when you would normally buy this course, you would go through it at your own pace. Each module logs out, uh, lock, um, lock, unlocks each week and you would slowly learn the material and do the quizzes and ask questions and any of the activities. But this time round, every two weeks for the next two months, Andre has agreed to be a live coach where you get to spend more time with him. So if you thought the webinar was great and having the ability to hang out with Andre via a webinar, imagine having a one-on-one -on -one coaching call with him or a group coaching call with him and access to him during this, this program. And that's one thing that I think is really um, special about this, this particular um, time is because everyone has a lot more time available. And so we're able to get facilitators attention rather than them being really busy. So this is really like a once uh, you know, you know, because we've been working with Andre for a long time, and this is one of the first times where we've actually been able to schedule, you know, two months worth of calls um, and 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 coaching. So, um, I guess you know, um, I'll just bring up another page. Um, what will happen is every two weeks you'll get invited to a live Zoom call. We will be moving to Zoom for this virtual classroom. Um, exercise just because it's a little bit more stable and everyone can share their video, ask questions, and we really want to get to know everyone uh, who, who's in who's involved um, in this. So that that will run. It will be every Thursday, roughly at the same time. So if you've been able to make this webinar, uh, you'll definitely be able to make the live Q and A's. Uh, you won't get access to this if you take the offer up after the pro this promotion. You'll just get the replay versions of it. And the best thing is, is we haven't put the price up. We, you know, we just want to really create really good value for everyone um, and, and get everyone starting or expanding and growing their regenerative, um, their regenerative journey. And so we just want to make this, uh, you know, I guess now is the, a perfect time to, uh, take action and spend time with others who are going uh, this uh, through you. Um, Helen, did you want to add anything or expand on some of the stuff I've just mentioned? No, I don't. Thank you. I think, you know, the invitation's there. If people are really keen to get together to work, um, I'll turn my camera on. I think if people are keen to be part of a group that goes on and work together, it's you couldn't ask for much more, I don't think. So we we welcome you and, yeah, uh, you'll be sending up more information, Ray, I guess. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'll just um, I'll just quickly share my screen again. Um, I actually needed to load that screen, which is why I threw to you, Helen. So I'm glad you did speak for a little bit. <laughs> That's a pleasure. With all transparency, I lost the screen and had to reopen it um, and needed time to think. 
<laughs> so this is, you know, this isn't planned. We just really wanted to share this information. I spoke to um, Andre a couple of days ago, really. Or this is why this webinar was kind of last minute as well, because we just kind of were talking and said, let's make something happen. Like the time is now. We need to um, inspire people to, to take action and, and get this done. And so I will um, pop up a little quick offer on the screen. It's nothing fancy. Um, so you do want to take up the offer. You can click the link. Um, and to top it off, not only do you get to spend oh, more time wow. with Andre, um, you get to, we're going to take $100 off because we feel that if you're here, you're stuck to this point of the webinar, we're nearly going an hour and a half. You're probably one of those people that takes action. And so we want action takers. So um, there is a coupon code there for you. It's 100 off um, that you will pop up in the, um, in the checkout process. Uh, it will take you to this page. It will give you a little bit more information. Probably everyone's wondering what is the price. It's $497. Now, all our prices, because we serve a global audience, as you can tell from the people who are in the webinar today, uh, all our prices are US dollars. So you will need to make the conversion around your currency. Um, so there's more information about what's included in the course, uh, all the lessons are outlined again. But the real value is not only do you get this course, but you also get 12 months access to our Farming Secrets Circle membership website. And so that's valued over $1,100. Um, and you'll get access to all the different menu tabs that you saw me showing on our website before, which is years and years of basically an information vault um of the course so i'll let you ponder on this um, um we, we, the, the first coaching call with andre will start in uh not next thursday the following thursday so there is a bit of a time frame if you want to get uh involved with that this will be the secure checkout that you're taken to you pop the coupon code um in this box here and click apply and as you can see it's all in usd uh, it will apply the $100 USD discount and then give you your new total. So um, I guess, you know, that's basically um, what we wanted to share with you today. We just thought the timing was really perfect to add extra value to that course that has been uh, available for some time. It's always been the same price. We haven't increased it to offer a discount. We just know that now is a great time to spend around like-minded people. And Andre has this ability to be available for us via our virtual classrooms. And we're just super excited to be able to offer that to not only um, people who have done this course, doing this course now for the first time, but for people who have done it in the past as well. So that's why we couldn't put the price up because we, you know it wouldn't be fair or anything like that. So we just wanna really get you to spend more time with Andre and the Farming Secrets community. Uh, learn out loud, share your results, share your challenges and have a virtual space that you can lean on, um, vent about, uh, scream about. Uh, we'll be here to care for you along your your journey. So that's, uh, you know, I think that's pretty much everything I wanted to get uh, through in this extra little bit. And apologies that we went over time for the hour that we normally allow for webinars. Um, but, um, you know, thank you for, for sticking around and, and, and hanging out with the Farming Secrets crew. Um now, before you go, I just want to point out that's a surprise to me, the $100 off, but I think that's great. If you're still here, grab it. Um, and the other thing is use in this group, you can use cameras and things to photograph your farm to share and which we wouldn't have had time to do today. But, you know, it's just it's like having Andre on your farm, really. It's just an awesome opportunity. And the other thing I noticed is because we're in Australia, we have to pay GST. So Ray's picture showed the price going up by 10%. But if you're overseas, that 10% won't be there. I just want to explain that, Ray. Yep. 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 The very good point. Yeah. So obviously we have GST as a local tax. So if you're in Australia, unfortunately, the government requires us to collect that on your behalf and send it to them. Uh, but if you're not from Australia, then that won't apply. So... Um, you know, the best thing is just to go to the checkout page and see what the price is in your uh, in your area. Um, and uh, a quick Google conversion will give you a rough estimate of what you're going to be charged. And the other thing, Ray, I've just thought of, are we going to restrict the amount of members if we're going to, going to um, be live with Andre? Or we're just yeah, going well, to the, sessions? Statistics show that a classroom of around 
18 to 22 is a comfortable, manageable space. So, um, you know, there will be a, a, a limit. Um, we, you know, my my theory is that not everyone will show up. So we probably can take in, you know, a little bit more and, um, um, and, and, and still give a really good user experience. A classroom with hundreds of people just doesn't give you enough one-on-one -on -one time, you know, yeah. so, yep. Okay, awesome. sorry, it's all off the cuff. So, you know. No, that's right. That's right. I'm we don't. Know, yeah. It was Monday when we decided to go with this webinar, and today is Thursday. So, <laughs> this is how quickly we, we, we move to um, add value and, and just, you know, I really hope that it shows that we just like to create stuff for the purpose of the community. Um, and when an opportunity presents, you know, a couple of months ago, we had lockdown and we put the live summit together. Again, that was a last minute quickly reach out to everyone. Um, you know, we like to get stuff done um, and it's always on the basis of, you know, adding value. Um, and if you weren't part of the summit, all the replays are also uh, in the back end circle website, which you get as being that bonus circle member for buying the course. So, you know, there's lots of information there, uh, lots of worksheets, activities. Um, the good thing is that wherever you get stuck, we will be able to point you to the right video, to the right mentor, um, we like to refer to ourselves as the glue that kind of helps people get um, you know, unstuck. That's not a weird analogy because <laughs> glue normally gets you stuck. So we glue everyone together to get you unstuck. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Okay. Well, it's been an absolute blast okay. hanging out with everyone. Thank you, everyone, for sticking uh, to the end. I really appreciate it. And I'm uh, glad you enjoyed the polls um, and uh, agree that it's a great offer. So thanks for the comments uh, in the chat. And uh, watch your inbox for the replay. And uh, I can give you a little sneak that there is another webinar next Wednesday, which will be a Q&A with Andre. Um, so if you've got any more questions or you speak during the week and you want more Q&As answered, uh, watch your inbox for another event next Thursday. Thanks, thanks everyone. Until Wednesday. next time, stay sharp. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Thanks. Thanks, Ray. No worries. Thanks, you guys. <clears throat>